excited today to have evangelist, evangelist Wayne McRae with us. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where, uh, sadly, it's, it, it's true that not all evangelists are ones that want to return us to the Word of God. Uh, some want to spout their standards. Some want to go on their hobby horses. What I greatly appreciate about Wayne McRae is a a time where he comes here, and he's been such a blessing to me personally for uh, filling the pulpit here, but he's one who returns us to the Word of God. So Wayne, you come and preach to us. Looking forward to it. Well, good morning to each of you. It is great to be with you today. As I look out, I see familiar faces. That's always something I count as a grand blessing Good to see you faithful, continuing on for the Lord, honoring him in all your ways, worshiping him this morning. What a blessing it was uh, to participate in the worship this morning. Amen. What a blessing it was for me and my wife, Patrice, and we always count it a tremendous honor uh, to come and be with you uh, for a time around God's precious word, uh, for a time in which we have opportunity to respond to the Lord. How many of you would agree that this has been a very interesting year? How many of you would agree with that? It has been for us as well. But the Lord is faithful, and in these turbulent and uncertain times, that which is unchanging becomes more precious to us. And our Lord does not change. He's the same always. And therefore, our faith stabilizes us in these very challenging days. Thank you, Pastor, for the honor of being able to minister to your people, those whom God has placed you over. You honor me greatly with this opportunity, and we thank you. If you would take your Bibles this morning and go with me to the book of Acts, the book of Acts, chapter number 14, Acts chapter number 14. There's a passage that God has used there to speak to my heart on a number of occasions. I pray, I trust, that it will be of value to you this morning at this season in your church's life. I'll begin reading in verse number 19, Acts chapter 14, verse number 19. I've entitled this morning's message, Elements of Effective Ministry, Elements of Effective Ministry. Acts chapter 14 Verse 19, there the Bible says, And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Howbeit as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas and, uh, to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they return again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And after they had passed throughout Pisidia, they came to Pamphy uh, Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down into Italia and thence sailed to Antioch from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And there they abode long time with the disciples. Would you join me in prayer once more, please? Our Father God, we come in Jesus' name. We are so thankful for the privilege that is ours to be in your presence this morning. Lord, we know that you never leave us and forsake us, but there's something special about when your people meet and when you meet among us. Our worship has been towards you. Our focus has been towards you. It is you that we want to exalt. I praise you, Father, for the text that you've chosen this morning for our edification. I beg you to use it in each of our hearts. 
God, I pray that in each of our lives that you would indeed return us to your precious word. I pray with Pastor and with the Lord Jesus that you would sanctify us with your truth. Your word indeed is truth. Use this time, I pray. Honor yourself. Edify your people. Draw the sinner unto Christ. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Elements of effective ministry. I think all of us desire to be effective in anything that we undertake. Certainly that is true when we undertake in the service of the Lord. In this passage, we find a tremendous example of effective ministry illustrated by Saul uh, and uh, Barnabas on, the first, on their first missionary journey. I look at this passage, I discover something about how God works, how God operates. Oftentimes, we are interested in new methods and new strategies, and those have their place. God is interested in the people and building those individuals into individuals he can use more effectively. Therefore, I look at this passage and I see several methods being employed, but I see more loudly, more clearly, more pronouncedly this, these characteristics, these traits exemplified by these men, and I believe that should be a part of our own spiritual experience. I believe we can serve Christ with dedication, as illustrated in this passage. I believe we can serve him with initiative, as Paul and Barnabas set forth here. I believe we should serve him with industry, the willingness to work and labor, work hard. I believe we should serve him with thoroughness and with accountability. If you'll allow me for just a few moments this morning to deal more intimately with these concepts, I believe you'll find here something that will encourage us in our service for Jesus Christ. Elements of effective ministry. The first one is dedication, as we mentioned previously. You find it in verse number 19. The Bible says, And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. Interesting how dedication is exemplified here. It is exemplified in many places in the book of Acts and in the lives of these servants, but certainly here. How is it exemplified here, Brother McRae? It is the fact that they were willing to endure and deal with and work through and press on with the ministry God had given them even though they were opposed. Oftentimes, our sense of definition or our understanding of our dedication can be seen through what we're willing to go through and stick with the purpose of God upon our lives. Often, we can understand that through such opposition. In this passage, we have such evidence. We also see dedication in the fact that they are on the mission field, serving Jesus Christ, reaching people, planting churches, doing the work that Christ literally called them to do. I see dedication in that. Previously in this chapter, I find that these believers were mistaken to be gods who had come down from the heavens in accordance with Greek mythology and things of that nature, who had come down and they named them Zeus. Uh, I'm sorry, they named them uh, uh, Mercury, and they, uh, and they named them Jupiter, Paul and Barnabas, and as a result of it, they thought they were gods who had come down because Paul had healed an individual and uh, restored his health. And again, they were, the people were literally geared towards worshiping Barnabas and Saul. They were bringing sacrifices and preparing to sacrifice unto them, but instead of taking that, instead of seizing the moment for personal and self-aggrandizement, they turned these individuals individual's attention back to God and the Lord Jesus Christ with the effort to try to reach them with the gospel. I see in that dedication. So often we can get caught up in the messengers and the ministers and we miss the God that they are pointing to. Amen? And these men took opportunity then to point these individuals who were lost to the true and living God. In all of this, I find great illustrations of what it means to be dedicated to that which God has given to us to do. 
Dedication refers to being committed to God's purpose. It refers to being committed to the associated tasks that God has given to us. It's the opposite of being half-hearted, lackadaisical. Uh, if it gets done, okay. If it doesn't get done, it doesn't really matter. Sometimes in government, when I was working in the Air Force, we would say sometimes, good enough for government work. We should never treat the work of the Lord that way. Anything we do for His honor and His glory should be with fervor and with dedication. We find in Paul here that literally the man was stoned. The people of Lystra perceived him to be stoned to death. Then they drug him outside of the city, left him there as dead, and then while the other disciples and converts were standing around him, Paul got up, brushed off the persecution, went back into town. Then the next morning he left to go on his mission. And when he got to the next city, guess what he did? He preached the gospel of Jesus Christ undeterred. Now, I don't know about you, but I haven't faced this that this week. How many of you have? Show of hands, please. You've been here? under a pile of rocks, stoned nearly to death. Nope, that probably doesn't describe most of us this morning, right? But if we attempt to do anything for Jesus Christ, we must be willing to be opposed by those who do not know our Lord and our Savior. The question is, will we allow that to stop us? The question is, will we be deterred from pursuing the will of Christ, though so expressly declared in the Scriptures, will we, will we be deterred, will we handle that opposition as a ready-made excuse to just walk away and back up? That's a legitimate question today. It's one I had to wrestle with myself on occasion. It's one every servant of God should wrestle with from time to time. Often, our dedication is illustrated by what we're willing to overcome and still follow through on what the Lord has called us to do. I remember serving in Germany, Pastor, as a missionary pastor in southern Germany, Bavaria, as a matter of fact. And uh, we had a family in the church at the time by the name of the Raphaels. That was their last name. And uh, the Raphael family was involved with everything. You said, Brother Raphael, Sister Raphael, I need you to, and they were already there. They were accomplishing it. Committed to the work of the Lord. Very dedicated. A joy to serve with. After about four years of serving in that capacity, the Lord relocated them to another base, but still in Germany. They were now roughly about an hour and 20 minutes drive away. So they went looking for a church in that area could not find one. They could not find a suitable church in that area of Germany. So for them, the decision was simple. We'll just drive back to our home church back at Berean, the church they had left. Every Sunday morning, they would arrive early. They'd stay through the afternoon at the church. They'd have lunch there, and they would be in the evening service every single Sunday. And if they could get there on a Wednesday night, they were there. Hour and a half drive one way. That's a lot of going to church, folk, as we would say down south, right? What were they willing to endure and deal with and overcome and still be faithful to the Lord? You see, this illustrates to some degree what they were willing to do. I remember another young lady at another church we were in, Pastor, when we were in Germany. This was at Grace Independent Baptist Church when my wife and I were stationed at Han Air Base at the time. And uh, there was a young lady by the name of Bianca. Bianca was a young German girl, about 14 years old. Bianca would walk to church, she would participate in the services, and then Bianca would walk home afterwards. When the church got a clue that Bianca was walking to church, they would offer her rides back and forth to church. On this one particular night, there was a certain meeting or something going on after the services, and Bianca needed a ride, so she approached my wife and I. I didn't know where Bianca lived. We had never given her a ride previously, but she asked us for a ride. We were glad to give her a ride home, of course. And I thought she was just kind of, you know, over the way and around the corner, and we'd drop her off. On the way home, I kept asking and referring to Bianca, do I keep going, or do I turn here, or are you in this neighborhood? She'll say, no, just keep going. 
A couple of those exchanges, just keep going. Turn here, turn there, oh, oh, turn here. And then finally we arrived. Three miles later, we arrived at Bianca's place. This kid was walking three miles one way to church back and forth. And she was faithful. She was committed. She demonstrated dedication. Beloved, let me say this just as clearly as I know how. If we allow things to deter us, then the devil will handle things and present them to us to deter us and cause us to quit. Our dedication is often exemplified by what we're willing to overcome to pursue and persist in what we know the Lord has tasked us to do. We see that exemplified in Paul and Barnabas. Paul was willing to be misunderstood, though he was not trying to be misunderstood. He was willing to be misunderstood, though it was consistent, though he was consistent with Christ's call upon his life. He was willing to suffer, and he saw suffering as normal, par for course, for the dedicated believer. And he continued the work of God without distraction. If you think it's distracting to be stoned, you have good reason to think that, but Paul was not beloved. The next day he gets up, leaves town, goes to the next town, and he preaches Jesus Christ. I'm saying to you, there will be opposition to the things of God. Opposition is normal. We accept it as such, and we take the counsel of the Scripture that where Paul beseeches the believer in Romans chapter number 12 and verse number 1, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You ask the question, an honest question, Brother McCray, what do you do in such challenging times and such points of opposition? What do you do? My counsel is real simple, beloved. You grab a fistful of the promises of God and you press on with what you know God has given you to do, knowing that we won't be stopped until God is done with us. That's what we do. Listen to the words of our Lord Jesus. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you, he says in Matthew chapter number 5. In Peter, in 1 Peter 4, Peter says this, If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, Happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. And we're reminded of the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The first thing I see is dedication exemplified by these men. I believe this is worth you and me trusting the Spirit of God to help us with our devotion as well. The second characteristic, the second quality I see is initiative. It's a natural outgrowth of dedication to express ourselves in taking some initiative. We see this in that they were preaching and teaching the gospel from city to city. They were about the work and they took initiative. Look at verse number 21, if you please. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. What city were they preaching the gospel and teaching many in? It's in verse number 20, the end of verse number 20. They came to Derby. That's where they were preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they took the initiative as they arrived into town. Pastor, obviously we weren't there when this transpired, right? How many of you were there when this was there? How many of you witnessed this? Oh, I didn't think so, right? None of us were there. You know, it's okay to smile in church. It, it really is. <laughs> None of us were there, of course. But look, beloved, listen to me carefully. Please listen to me carefully. These men, without a special messenger from heaven, without a big booming voice from the, from the sky, 
without a special initiative of God to dispatch someone to tell them what to do, they showed up in Derby and they pursue the work of communicating Christ to the lost. They took the initiative. Amen? I suppose we need more of that today. Wouldn't you agree? Understanding what Christ has said to do. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Understanding what He's already commanded and commissioned us to do. Amen? Understanding that, these men arrived into town taking care of the business of preaching Jesus Christ. Again, obviously, we were not there. But we could just imagine how that might have transpired. Paul being a very intelligent man, well-educated in the things of God, thorough knowledge of the Scriptures, understanding the grace of God. I can just see him coming into Derby and beginning to preach. Can't you see him? As people begin to make their way through, taking care of commerce, taking care of business for the day, Paul would find himself a place, perhaps a public place, and just begin to preach Jesus Christ. Perhaps it went something like this. We beseech you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. And I could just see Paul preaching something like that. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I can see Paul doing something like that. And people perhaps would begin to gather, perhaps just a few, and then he would teach them, as the Scriptures say, more discreetly the Gospel message, and then some of those would trust Jesus Christ as Savior. Well, on this trip, Pastor, there was Barnabas as well. I don't know who you think Barnabas to be, or what, he, what kind of image he strikes in your mind's eye, but can I share with you what kind of image he strikes for me? Can I do that? Do I have your permission to do that? Thank you. Thank you for being so generous. I appreciate that. I could just see Barnabas. Barnabas, big, robust guy. Very Jewish, of course. He and Paul, of course. Uh, I, 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 I envision Barnabas as being this robust person with very thick eyebrows, a rich voice. Can you see him? Barnabas, the son of consolation. That's what the Bible calls him. Barnabas was an encourager. Amen? You remember that? Barnabas is the kind of guy who sells the farm and give all the money to the church to take care of the poor. That was Barnabas. Remember him? That's him. That's his profile. And I could just see old Barnabas preaching his heart out to that crowd, finding a place down distant from Paul, finding a place where people are milling about, and they take the initiative to just preach Jesus Christ. And I could hear old Barnabas perhaps saying something similar to this. I, being a Jew, tried to keep the law and obey God, believing that I could be acceptable to God by keeping the law. But then I heard of the grace of God in Jesus Christ, and I trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And you could just see Barnabas weeping. You could see Barnabas calling out. You could see Barnabas telling that crowd to come to Jesus Christ to know the forgiveness of sins. Can't you see him? Can't you see him preaching? Can't you see him inviting people? Now, Pastor Ben, tell me, how many times did God dispatch an angel from heaven to tell them to do that? Not once. How many times did the Lord Jesus speak from the clouds and says, go preach to these people? Not once. You don't see that in the text. What you see is them arriving in Derby and then undertaking the work in a way that was applicable to them and relevant to their audience, and they reached out with the gospel of Jesus Christ. They took the initiative. Oh, how we today need to look at our opportunities far more seriously and take some initiative to communicate Jesus Christ. Amen. We expect our missionaries to do it where they go to represent us. Our missionaries expect us to do it right here at home. Amen? Something to think about. They took the initiative preaching Jesus Christ. Amen. And amen. I don't know, beloved, what you think about methods and so forth. My point here is not to highlight a method or a strategy. My point here is to highlight character, qualities that make for effective ministry. Not merely doing the right things, but being the right people. People of initiative, people of dedication, 
There's a third thing that I find here that I think is interesting also, if you will allow it. It's the simple truth that they were industrious. These men were not afraid of labor. They were not so much a lover of convenience that convenience and the love for that interfered with the needs of the work. They were willing to work and work hard to execute the will of Jesus Christ. So you see labor. You see them servicing these disciples and servicing these new church plants. Beginning in verse 21 through verse number 23. Can I read it once more? And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed." I see hard work involved in these verses. The verbs convey it quite convincingly. You see in verse 22, the word confirming the souls of the disciples. You see them also exhorting them. You see them also uh, commending them to the Lord. And you find them also in verse number 23, ordaining leadership. They had already reached these individuals These churches were established on the first leg of this particular missionary journey. And now they're coming back through these cities of Iconium, Lystra, and Antioch. And they're doing these type of laborious ministries among these converts. It's interesting, isn't it? Isn't it? This is the work and labor of the churches. Of these missionaries, these servants of God among converts and churches. Look at verse 22 again, confirming the souls of the disciples. Do you see that? Confirming basically means to establish them, to strengthen them, to render them more firm. That's the idea. They came into these particular cities, these three cities. One of the things they wanted to do with these new converts and these new churches that were established on the first leg of this particular journey was they wanted to confirm these believers, to establish them, to strengthen them, to render them more firmly in the faith. Amen? That's an interesting concept, isn't it? I think it is. You know what new Christians need? If I could say it quite simply. You know what they need? They need to be confirmed. Oh, I'm not talking about some ceremony that some church does. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about them finding a place and a sense that they belong within the heart and life of the New Testament church that reached out to them with the gospel. Our job is not done when we reach them. Our work has only begun when they've converted and trusted Jesus Christ. A church then therefore must be postured to confirm those believers. Let me ask you a question. Would you interact with me a little bit? How many of you remember the day when you got saved? How many of you remember that? How many of you were there the day you got saved? How many? Re- I was there too. It was a great day. Lovely day, lovely day. How many of you came into this saying, I got this? I understand everything that needs to be done. I I so have this. I know what to do right here, right now. How many of you came in doing that? None of us. None of us. I grew up in church, and when I got saved at 22 years of age, I still did not have this. Amen? It was a new world, beloved. Understanding what it meant to be in a relationship with God took some time. But it also took some believers coming alongside me to encourage me and to coach me and to help me see that reality. In dealing with my sin, now that I'm saved, I still fail. What do I do with that? There was someone there to help me understand. But Brother McCray, you confess your sin. God will forgive you. You understand? Somebody there to help us with the remedial things of the Christian faith. And then when it comes to becoming a part of a New Testament church, what helps a person take that step of baptism and then finally uniting with a congregation? There must be some servant in that church that creates on purpose by the grace of God an affinity with that new convert. So that when they come, they'll start by coming because you're here. 
and you encourage them. Amen. Eventually, that'll be transferred to Jesus Christ. But there must be somebody who takes the initiative to be a friend, to answer questions, and to be a companion to that new convert. Someone they can pick up the phone and ask a question. Someone they can ask a question about the Word of God. Someone that can pray with them and help them. We want to put it in a box and then through a series of classes and then say they've been through it and they're ready. No, God brought us into a relationship with himself and he wills for, us to, for that new convert to be brought into a relationship with his New Testament church. It takes individuals in that church postured to be that friend of the convert. Amen? As a result of it, the individual will be confirmed and established and stabilized in the Christian faith on a remedial level. I submit to you, beloved, you can do that. Amen. You can do that. You can do that kind of ministry. Confirming. There's another word that's used here, Pastor. Let's see if I can get it real quick. It's the word exhorting. The word exhorting is used. If you notice in verse number 22, it's used, exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. To exhort carries the idea to entreat, to instruct, and to admonish. All three components may be evident at a given time or just one element, but to entreat, to instruct, or to admonish. To invite them into something, to give them instruction in that experience, and then guide them, lead them, yes, no, maybe, a little more to the left, a little more to the right, as they go through it, we coach them. Amen? Exhorting. How many of you ever learned to drive, right? Yeah, you got behind the wheel and you had it down pat the first time, right? No, someone showed you, now here's how you do it. Left seat. Then they say, now you do it. And now you're in the driver's seat. And they coach you. Okay, tap the brakes easy, e easy, easy. What about that three-point turn, right? Remember how they back you into parallel parking? Remember that experience? How many of you remember that? Yeah, they coach you through it. It's the same concept here. We don't come into the Christian faith understanding all the particulars about it. We don't understand. I've been saved 25 years and through some seminary training preacher, and I still don't understand it all. Amen? Nor will we ever, but for the new convert, for the person trying to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they need someone who can take them and say, this is how it's done. You invite them into a spiritual experience. You show them how to do it. You give them instruction. Here's what you do first. Here's what you do second. Here's what you do third. And then you coach them, guide them, admonish them, and direct them as they try to do it themselves. Amen? I've seen this illustrated so wonderfully between my wife and daughter. They don't know I watch them sometimes, and I take illustration from it. And this morning, I'm going to use them in an illustration. I hope it's a good one and not too embarrassing. Sometimes, little wife, she'll approach our daughter, Crystal, and she'll say, Crystal, let's bake a cake. Let's bake a yellow cake with chocolate icing. Crystal will sometimes moan and say something like this, oh, mom, you know. And then little wife will insist, then Crystal will give in. Then the little wife will say, now here's what we're going to do, Crystal. We're going to mix all the wet items, and then we're going to mix all the dry items, and then we're going to join them all together. And she would tell Crystal, now I want you to do this part, and she'd coach her through it. And then she'd tell her, do this part, and then she'd coach her through that. Next, you want to do this, given the instruction, step by step. And they would mix it. And then she would tell Crystal, now don't beat it too hard, or don't beat it too long. Now, I'm using their language. I'm not sure what that means, but I think I got the right motion here. <laughs> don't beat it too hard. Don't beat it too long because it won't rise. She gives a little admonition, a little instruction to make her more precise in her execution, right? And so they go through this process. When they're done, we've got a chocolate cake, and it's good. Amen? Yeah. You see, that's how, that's how it is when we exhort as used here. With new converts, we entreat, we invite them into an opportunity. 
Hey, hey, would you go share the gospel with me? Hey, would you go and pass out tracts with me? You won't have to say a thing. I'll do all the talking. Hey, would you go to me with this, to this Bible study? I mean, you invite them into a spiritual opportunity. And then if there's instruction to be given, we give them that instruction. First, we're going to knock on the door. Second, you're going to hear me say these things. Thirdly, I'm going to try to do this if God will open the door to us. Fourthly, we're going to do this. And then the convert is just watching as they're being coached. And then the next door or the next several doors or maybe on the next several occasions, we switch roles and they lead now. Yes. And we give them feedback after they do it. Right? And we tell them something like this. Now remember, your job is to present the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the Holy Spirit's job to get them under conviction. Don't get ahead of him. And we admonish. Amen? We give instruction and we give admonition. We invite them in. We give the step-by-step -step instruction. And then we watch it. Now we give admonition to help them hone and refine that particular Christian skill set under the operation of the Spirit of God. Am I communicating okay this morning? I'm saying, beloved, you can do that. God's people are to do that. Say, Brother McCray, I'm not doing that in 100 years. Then disobey Jesus Christ as a consequence. We don't want that, do we? Amen. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it, right? But we're willing to work and work hard and prepare well to execute the ministry and work of Jesus Christ with excellence. Amen. He's just kind of worth it, isn't he? Amen. And I got to close. My time's gone already. Good night, preacher. I got two more points, too. <laughs> I took too much time explaining. There are other things here. There are other things here. I'll not go into them. They were confirming these believers. They were exhorting these believers. They also ordain leadership in these churches now. And then the Bible tells us that they commended them to the leadership and authority of Jesus Christ to pursue his will over them. We see another element here, and I'll just mention it as I prepare to close, and that is the characteristic of thoroughness. They revisited these cities, and they conducted evangelistic campaigns, and they were being thorough in the execution of the work. In other words, they cared enough about it to sweat the details and to ensure that they had been explicitly and implicitly obedient to the will of Jesus Christ in each instance. The last one I'll give you is this, and is that when they returned to their home church in Antioch, from whence they had been sent out, verse 27, verse, excuse me, verse, verse 26 and verse 27, we find that they reported to the church as to what God had done among the Gentiles. Listen to verse 27. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. We see now that they're reporting and declaring what God had done with them and through them as they executed the mission. And this is an exercise in what we would call accountability. These, watch it now, these exceptional servants of God still recognize the authority of the Lord Jesus over them, the authority of their New Testament church, and they were willing and gladly reporting on what God had done. This was a great encouragement to the church that they had followed the will and plan of God and that the will and plan of God was being executed on the mission field now through these churches that had been established. But these men, though they had been exceptional servants, still submitted themselves to this kind of accountability. Amen. Oh, beloved, we should encourage our young people to make great decisions for Jesus Christ and encourage them to follow through on those decisions. Amen? Holding them accountable. Yes, beloved. Yes, I can't develop that more. Let me just suffice to say that there are many methods and strategies that we can employ, and sometimes technology avails opportunities to us that we can seize and use for the advancement of the work of Jesus Christ. Certainly that's true. But what I'm giving you this morning is not a matter, in a, a matter of strategies. It's the kind of person God can work through freely. And this is not the entire description. But in this text, we see that they're at least dedicated. They take initiative 
They show and demonstrate industry, just a willingness to roll up the sleeves and do the hard work that's necessary. They're thorough about it because they care about it. And as a result of it, they are accountable to the Lord, to their church. They cannot produce the results, but they can give an account for their efforts and their invested time and energy. Amen? With these kind of servants, beloved, gone before us, you and I have had tremendous models that we can learn from. Let us, let us trust the Spirit of God to enable us to become such servants. Maybe you're already dedicated. Maybe you already show initiative. Maybe you're already a person of industry when it comes to the things of God. Maybe God wants to make you more thorough. Maybe God wants to make you understand that you're accountable to your Lord and to your church. Whatever the need may be this morning, let's ask the Lord to develop these qualities in us. Because God's not merely looking for new methods, merely. God's looking for the right kind of person that he can work through freely. Amen? Let us dare to trust God to make us, to develop us, to build us inside into such individuals. Pastor? Sir, thank you for that time in the word and uh, the emphasis not just on little methods that we can just exercise, but the, the person that God wants us to become. I asked Wayne to challenge us about reaching our Jerusalem. Folks, we are called not just to pay money to send people around the world with the gospel, but God calls us to impact hearts and lives right here in our Jerusalem for the name of Jesus and that's what he's called us to do. And so here's a, here's a challenge for us, a challenge for me, that am I dedicated, am I taking initiative in my relationship, am I industrious about the work of the Lord, am I thorough in the details of ministry, and am I accountable as I report uh, what God's doing in and through me. And so I pray it's a help and encouragement to you. Let me pray that God would use this in your life and mine, and we'll have some closing announcements and the music team to come close us out here. Let's pray together. God, thank you for time in the word this morning. Thank you, God, for this example of, of the Apostle Paul that we, we love to put on a pedestal in, in a way that sometimes causes us to see him and say, oh, he, isn't he great, but I can't do what he did. And Lord, I thank you for the text this morning that, that breaks it down into bite-sized pieces for us to say this is what God has called us to do. And so, Lord, would you continue your work in us? Would you continue to transform us by your spirit? Help us to be the people that you've called us to be, and, and the methods and strategies will, will push out from there. God, I pray that you'd, you'd transform and work in us. Help us to be ones that say, I want to live out the very words of God, and that's going to make me missional in, in how I live out in front of my neighbors, in front of my family, in front of my church, in front of my community. And, and so, Lord, we, we need your word. We need your truth. Thank you for the chance we've had to be in it today. And I pray these things in Jesus' name.